This episode of Literary Treks is brought to you by Audible.com, offering more than 180,000 titles for smartphone, tablet, and desktop. To get a free audiobook of your choice and to help Trek FM at the same time, visit audibletrial.com slash trekfm. And also by Enterprise in Space, an international program of the nonprofit National Space Society. Find out how you can help science and education and become a virtual crew member aboard the NSS Enterprise Orbiter by visiting enterpriseinspace.org. And if you want to join the conversation and share your thoughts on this episode, join the Babel Conference, our listeners group on Facebook. Just type B-A-B-E-L into the Facebook search field. We look forward to seeing you there. Hey everyone, I'm Rod Roddenberry and you're listening to Trek FM. taking all these books? I thought I'd take some light reading, in case I got bored. Hey everyone, and thank you for downloading Literary Treks number 262. Today in the feature, we're going to be talking about a Voyager novel, and I can't do that alone. In fact, I feel like I might need more than one person to help me with that. But first, helping me as he does every week is the amazing, wonderful, uh, Treklicious Bruce Gibson. Bruce, how's it going? I'm doing f- fabulous, trekliciously fabulous. It's hard to I've think never of heard new adjectives that. every week. That's I know. <laughs> like we shouldn't even just bother with that. We just say, "Hey, you know, hi, I'm Bruce, and Dan's with me." Okay, so let's start the show. <laughs> you remember that guy, Bruce, right? Well, he's here again. <laughs> Excellent. As always. Yeah. Totally. <laughs> Well, as I mentioned in the feature today, we are going to be doing a Star Trek Voyager novel, the first book in the Spirit Walk duology by Christy Golden. Uh, The novel is Old Wounds, and we're going to have a special guest joining us to talk about that. Uh, It's not the author, but it's another host here on Trek FM, and we're really excited to have her. Or or him. Oh, I'm I'm narrowing it down too much. Anyway, you'll see when we get there. Oh, I want to know. I want to (laughs) know. Before we get there, though, we do have a couple things to talk about. Not a lot of news stories coming out about books and comics yet. We're kind of in a bit of a drought for announcements, but we do have a new comic that we are going to review. And this is one that I've been anticipating because I did really enjoy the first issue. This is the second issue of the Q Conflict, that big crossover series with Uh, Four different Starfleet crews, all of them being pitted against one another by various omnipotent beings. So, yeah, the Q conflict, issue two. Before we really get into it, Bruce, what are your kind of initial impressions of this one when you read it? I have mixed feelings about this. I'll tell you. I had a feeling you'd say that because me too. Oh, okay. Well, (laughs) when I started it, I just thought, you know, this seems so like goofy and fan fiction and look i don't want fan fiction to be a negative but there is some bad fan fiction out there and there's some really good i'll give that but you know it's just the whole idea that they're bringing all these crews together q's doing it and he's competing like i like the basic concept of it but it just seems like a gimmick you know the whole thing Mm -hmm. just seems like a gimmick however once you accept the fact okay it's a gimmick As you're going through and you just want to have fun with it, it is kind of cool to see the crews mixed up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree with that as well. Initially, you know, these particular omnipotent beings, they don't seem like the types that would be doing this sort of thing. Like, you know, the Organians, as we saw in the original series, I'm like, they're not, they don't like to interfere at all. And uh, the Metrons didn't seem like they'd be into this kind of thing. But like you said, once you kind of just, accept the absurdity of it and go along with it it can be a lot of fun there are a few choices that the writers have made that i'm kind of questioning though because we get uh you know on the second page of this issue we get a nice kind of summary of the various teams right and we've got kirk's crew that they've picked and and 
what's really cool is it's not just Kirk's crew against Picard's crew against Cisco's against Janeway's. They're they've been like team captains basically, and the omnipotent beings have chosen various people to go in their crew. So, like you said, uh, Spock is Picard's first officer in this one, and etc. So all these crews are really mixed up. But they've made some omissions that seem really strange to me. Like the doctor from Voyager isn't in this and neither is Neelix. And you may feel about that however you will. But, you know, like there's just certain people missing that I'm like, oh, I would have liked kind of the the doctor's acerbic wit in some of this. But for some reason, he's not a part of this. I didn't even pick up on that, that the doctor yeah. was missing. But it's interesting, too, because in the first page, Quark is like, why am I here? I'm not even in Starfleet. I'm not a crew member. Yeah. And, and stuff like that, where it seems odd they would have grabbed the crew of Deep Space Nine plus the bartender, <laughs> you know, right. like, yeah, his name's in the main credits of the show, but in universe they don't necessarily know that i guess but you know whatever it's it's they're omnipotent beings maybe they do have access to deep space nine's credits or something (laughs) so as we get into this story the uh the first kind of challenge of this contest is laid out and it has to do with the iconians and their famous gateway system so they have uh, one of the Iconian planets. It's presumably not the Iconian homeworld that Picard discovered in the neutral zone in TNG, but one of their planets. And some of their gateways are running out of control. And the teams are tasked with uh, finding and capturing the gate, the Iconian's gateway engine. So this piece of tech that controls all the gateways. Now, I was kind of surprised how quickly the crews were like, yeah, let's get into this. Let's let's compete against the other teams. And, you know, Riker in particular gets pretty devious and disables Picard's shuttle with the prefix code as they're racing towards the uh, Iconian planet and stuff. Did that kind of surprise you that they were so quick to be like, OK, yeah, let's let's compete here. No, absolutely. I, I felt the exact same way because I was like. I thought they were going to resist it and try to talk out of, you know, try to convince Q and the others that they don't need to be doing this and this is ridiculous. But yeah, it was like, Q's like, okay, it's a relay race and go. And they're like, okay. And they start sprinting practically. <laughs> they <laughs> jump on the ships and here we go. It, yeah. It, I don't know. I mean, mm. yeah. Mm, yeah. Mm, yeah. Yeah. Mm. so yeah it it seems a little bit odd to me as well and you know i'm enjoying this i I think it's okay um the focus of this story seems to be mostly on kirk and the crew that he has and janeway and the crew that she has and i'm assuming later issues will kind of explore more about the other crews but janeway's crew you know seems to be the main focus of this one there are a couple other things that bugged me and I don't usually like to criticize the artwork too hard, but there are a couple things um, on one, sh- one page we get a shot of Voyager's bridge and the computer consoles in the background are just like stock images of different blueprints for different ships. And that really bugged me. And then Voyager's shuttlecraft, every time they show it flying, the rear door is open for some reason as it's flying through space uh, when they show the exterior views. <laughs> yeah, why would like, that be? <laughs> oh, I'm assuming the the like image that they took as a reference, there's one shot of that particular shuttle, shuttlecraft sitting in the shuttle bay with the door open. I'm assuming that's what they used as reference, but... <laughs> It really bugs me that it's flying around with the rear door open every time we see it. I guess they don't have a light in the shuttlecraft that bings when the trunk is open. (laughs) There you go. They really, that's some sort of technology that's been lost over the next 300 years or so. That makes sense. (laughs) But, you know, for the most part, I really do uh, enjoy um, this novel. And I'm curious what the, what the, motivation was for the writers to pair these particular crew members up if it was kind of like let's all throw them in a hat and draw them and do it that way or if they have specific story ideas that they thought would work really well with these pairings because there's some really neat stuff that comes out of this i think in particular wharf being on kirk's crew and wharf being uneasy serving in the 23rd century environment because 
of, you know, his people's history with, uh, with Starfleet at that time and that sort of thing. Yeah. I don't, I didn't think it was random. I think they probably had a lot of fun saying, Oh, who would be best on Kirk's? Oh, let's put Worf with Kirk, mm-hmm. you know, cause the Klingons weren't at peace during that time frame, So that would be interesting. And yeah, I think they'd probably just had fun just matching up who to put where. I, and that's the thing that I, I kind of enjoy about it. It's almost like a role playing game or like Star Trek online or something like, hmm, like you can yeah. pick and choose your own crew. That's almost what it feels like, but it's mm-hmm. neat to see these images of them on starships where you see seven to nine and Yohora sitting next to each other on the bridge of the enterprise E and Odo mm-hmm. is back at a console. I mean, it's just like, just to see them all kind of intermixed together like that is, is fun. Yeah, there's definitely some fun pairings like that. And and like you said, it feels maybe a little bit fan fiction-y, but, you know, that's that's kind of okay. It's kind of like with, with the Transformers stuff. You just have to kind of accept that it's fun and silly uh, and that sort of thing. And I'm curious to see where it goes from here. It's one of those concepts, too, that if you start to examine it too closely, you start coming up with questions that you're like, oh, I don't know if they're actually answering that or if they're just letting it go. Like, what time period are they all in? Because they're all at the same time going to this Iconian planet. Is this in the 23rd century? Is this in the 24th century? Like, what's going on? But, you know, it's it's kind of like, okay, you just have to say, I'm going to put those questions aside and just enjoy the story. It's so interesting how we can just quickly accept Star Trek versus Transformers. <laughs> exactly. And then we go into this and it's, well, yeah, you just kind of have to put aside. I, I think this is the thing I struggle the most with comics, Star Trek comics, is a lot of times I don't think you know what you're going to get in terms of style and tone and the d- direction of the genre. Like, is it going for silly? Is it going for campy? Is it going for serious? Is it trying to be artistic? You know, it's the comics always seem to conflict with each other in tone to me. So it's like when you go to this and you, your initial thought is before you open the page that, Oh, this is a mini series about Q and you kind of have in your mind what that is going to feel like. And then when you open it up and you see all these crews being mixed to match, all of a sudden you have to kind of roll your eyes and go, okay, this is kind of weird. This is kind of campy. But yeah, once you get to the point where you accept that, it can be fun. But then for me, I think, well, is this really something I wanted to begin with? Is this the kind of storytelling I want from Star Trek? I mean, I'm Mm. not, I don't want to put it down, but sometimes there's things like this that come up where I'm just like, you know, are, are we, trying to have a little too much fun, I guess, is where I'm getting at. Where And maybe I'm just, t- I take it a t- bit too seriously. Mm-hmm. And you kind of, yeah, like you kind of have to not take it seriously in order to enjoy it. So I totally see where you're coming from. And just from you saying that, I got an image in my head of Cisco in Trials and Tribulations. Too much fun. <laughs> and yeah, maybe that's kind of what this is. And, you know... It's a little bit too much fun, but you can almost think of it, you know, as fiction set in the Star Trek universe rather than actual these people actually doing this in the Star Trek universe, if that makes sense. Well, I also feel sometimes with comics that they take shortcuts in the storytelling because there's only so many pages and there's so much you can fit in where a Mm -hmm. novel, I think you have a little more room to breathe for the most part, but I think this could be a really interesting, I was going to say fascinating story, (laughs) if you really would dive deep into this and maybe have a little more uh, room to understand why Q is doing what he's doing and and the crew fighting against him more to the point that, you know, maybe he threatens them and then they feel like they do have to compete and there's communications between the crews as to we've got to do this, but, you know... We also need to strategize, like, how are we going to get out of this? You know, like, I want more of that as opposed to what you're saying. It's like, well, we're in what we're in. Let's just go and do it. (laughs) You know, but Mm -hmm. there's only so many panels. There's only so many pages. Yeah, that makes sense. Just looking at the story itself again, I'm wondering if 
because Kirk's crew is just a few seconds behind Janeway's crew and Janeway beats them out a little bit. I wonder if they're behind because they took the time to put on the landing party jackets from Star Trek, the motion picture, which I thought was cool. I love seeing them. I thought that was really cool too, (laughs) (laughs) but it slowed them down. See Janeway and her crew, they're just wearing their regular uniforms. They didn't stop for any field jackets. Yeah. (laughs) Why? Yeah. Why is one crew putting field jackets on and another is (laughs) not That's just what you do when you're in the motion picture era, which I guess they must be kind of close to. (laughs) <laughs> but yeah, you know, if this was a Star Trek animated series or something, I mean, maybe, you know, I guess that's sometimes how you have to look at comics sometimes. Comics is comics is its own medium, and so it plays differently than what we see on TV shows, which plays differently than what you see on movies. I mean, the movies play differently than the TV shows, and the novels play differently than the comics and the TV show, you know? So mm-hmm. each medium has its own kind of flavor. You just, in the comics, I think you get a little more variety of flavors. Definitely. Yeah. Well, this flavor, I have to say by the time it's all said and done, I enjoyed it. And I'm curious to see what the next flavor in this ish in this series is like. So I, yeah, it's, it's, it's a bit of a like, eh. Not everyone's going to love this, but I enjoyed it. That's kind of where I stand on this. It's like getting a hamburger and they put peanut butter on it, which I have had. Hmm. And you go, really? Okay. Why are we putting peanut butter on a hamburger? And then you bite into it and you're like, eh, I don't know. And then you eat a little more of it. And you go, you know, it's not bad. I kind of like this. <laughs> that's how this is. <laughs> yeah, that's weird. <laughs> but Okay. Yeah, it's like a hamburger with peanut butter on it. Mm-hmm. Well, on that note, let's uh, jump over to our next segment where we are going to discuss some feedback that we got on the Babel Conference for Literary Treks 260, Sorry to All the Sela Fans, and that is on the TNG novel Death in Winter by Michael Jan Friedman. So we got... Quite a few comments on this one, and I think there's a lot of people very excited that we're getting into the relaunch uh, post-Nemesis TNG stories. You know, whatever of the 50 words they used to describe that series, the lit verse, post-Nemesis continuity, whatever you want to call it. Um, Lots of really great comments. Um, And I think we're going to start with what was my favorite comment on the whole thing by Janessa Ciarda, and I... I hope I'm saying that name right. I apologize if I have that wrong. But she says, sadly, Seal is still a prominent character in Star Trek Online. I compensate for this by selecting the meanest conversation options whenever my captain has to talk to her. I thought that was hilarious <laughs> because, like me, not much of a fan of Sela. So <laughs> that really made me laugh. I thought that was great. Well, at least you know that Sela lives on into the 25th century. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, she's still kicking around. And then Justin Ozer says, you wanted recipe requests, so please let me know your favorite Rokig blood pie recipe. (laughs) Well, uh, I don't actually have one, but that would be, you know, I've always thought it would be fun to have like a Star Trek themed party with Star Trek foods and stuff. Uh, I've done Star Wars before. We, We had a bunch of people over to watch uh, Star Wars movies right around the la- time The Last Jedi came out and we had all Porg themed foods. So we had uh, <laughs> Porgs in a blanket, uh, all kinds of stuff like that. And uh, I'd love to do that for Star Trek. That'd be cool. Yeah, I remember you doing that. Yeah, we'd have to do that with Star Trek and get that Neelix cookbook out and cook yeah. up some things, right? <laughs> so <laughs> Fricasseed tribbles? Mmm. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. Don't hurt the tribbles. No, no. <laughs> and then Justin Ozer also says, we actually have a theory in our upcoming Earl Grey episode number 268 about why Sela behaves the way that she does. I'll be interested to see what you think of it. Well, Justin, you just assume that we listen to your show and we do not <laughs> allow promoting of other shows here on the network. I'm kidding. <laughs> now, I am going to be interested to listen to that because I do listen to Earl Grey. So, yeah, uh, I'm curious to see what you guys have to say. Kimberly Lawler says, this book was so disappointing to me in a it could have been so much better way. Very interested to hear what you thought about it. So I'll post some actual feedback after I listen to it. So 
we got that comment before she had finished it and she does comment later uh quite extensively about the book which we'll get to at the end because i really like some of the comments she had there Ooh, a teaser wow <laughs> there you go so justin ozer hey didn't he post something earlier <laughs> He says, I actually really enjoyed this novel when I read it a while back. Interesting that you thought the Picard and Crusher plot was the B story because it felt like the A story to me with how it weaves its way through the book. There were moments that there were a bit too much, but I do love that Picard and Crusher end up together. I agree that what's happening within the Romulan Empire with the power struggles is fascinating. I also love how that involves in future novels. It's interesting also, Justin, that you picked up on the A and B stories differently than we did. And I just found an old review from uh, Christopher Jones of Trek FM, of course, and who used to be (laughs) host of Literary Treks. He did his review on Goodreads of this novel, and he picked it up the same way Dan and I did. But everybody's perceptions are usually different. Oh, and then Justin also says, just got to the closing and hearing Bruce's Jean-Luc and Beverly had me laughing like crazy. So, again, I don't imitate Jean-Luc and Beverly. I don't think I'm good at it. But, you know, if you didn't listen to the end, then good for you. You missed that because it's it's pathetic. (laughs) I thought it was pretty funny. (laughs) Okay, maybe it's funny. Well, Bill Sweet says, good podcast. This may inspire me to read these post-Nemesis TNG novels. I kind of lost interest when I read the Time 2 books and went back to reading just TOS novels. I was disappointed with this book as I was hoping for more Crusher Picard material, and having read the Vulcan's Heart, Soul, etc. books, all of the Romulan intrigue kind of makes my head spin, and I thought Diane Duane did it better, nothing personal. I mean, to be fair, Diane Duane is a legend, so that's understandable. I don't seem to end up enjoying Michael Jan Friedman's books for some reason. He does a lot of referring to screen canon, but somehow I don't enjoy it as much as I do when the fan callouts are in the hands of somebody like Peter David, who can go so over the top, but keeps it fun, in my opinion. I love your thoughts. It seems, yeah, this book was a little bit of a disappointment to some people. Um, kind of lukewarm on this one, and that seems to be a very common um, feeling about this book. But, uh, you know, the Romulan intrigue stuff is the one thing that I did like. And I think we're getting into some cool stuff with the uh, later novels that it leads into in the relaunch. Oh, yeah, I can't wait for that. So Matt Rushing, who also used to co-host Literary Treks, he posted, Good episode. I remember being very disappointed in this book because I wanted it to be about Picard and Crusher. In the end, I am glad it's there just because it gets them together. Finally. Well, see, there again, you know, he's not looking this as much as a Picard Crusher novel as he thought it would be like like we did. So, yeah, well, Matt, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but like you said, we finally got them together. That's the great thing. Mm-hmm. And and like I said, when we were reading this novel, I was worried that we wouldn't because it was literally in the last two pages that it happens. So that's crazy. Well, Kimberly Lawler returns, having now read the novel. She says, So upon listening, it sounds like you were a bit nonplussed by this novel, too. I liked the Romulan plotline, but while I remembered the Stargazer characters from Reunion, they weren't my favorites, and I wasn't entirely sure what they were doing here. And the way the Picard Crusher storyline, which was supposed to be the main plot, was done was just flat-out disappointing. I say that as someone who has admittedly written a fair amount of fan fiction in this regard. I am not a published writer, but some of the actual Picard Crusher scenes read like poor fan fiction, of the type I strive to avoid as a reader and a writer. Your reaction to the last couple of scenes in the novel, surprised and a little confused, was my reaction exactly. These two characters are pretty mature, restrained, and deliberate, and that isn't quite how Friedman wrote them. Also, the episodes that Friedman chose to call out in the novel for examples of their past history were not at all what I would have chosen. Dunna light that candle! (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> anyway, honestly, Q squared <laughs> is probably a better depiction of the Picard Crusher relationship than this one, and that features crazy alternate timelines, but at least they ended up together, and I think subsequent TNG authors have handled it well. Thanks for a nice episode. Well, thank you so much for those comments, Kimberly, and yeah, this one seems like a bit of a misstep in a lot of the areas that you pointed out there, and I have a hard time disagreeing with anything you said there. So, yeah, thank you so much for your thoughts. 
Yeah, so this episode that we're referring to that we did Death in Winter was episode number 260, and the title of that episode was Sorry to All the Sela Fans. And Travis James earlier in the post said, Sela played a huge role in this book. Why sorry? And Dan, you answered that. Yeah, and and that the usually on literary treks we try and take the titles from something that was said uh, during the episode. And I think I was going on one of my little rants about my dislike of the character Sela. So that was my apologies to fans of the character out there. Uh, when I said, you know, sorry to all the Sela fans, because I just spent the last five minutes, you know, saying that I didn't think she was a great character. So, uh, yeah, I, I reiterate my apologies. If anybody out there is a Sela fan, um, she's okay. She's just definitely not my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, not a big fa- fan here either of Sela, but she's okay. Yeah, she has her moments. Well, thank you so much for all of the feedback. And if you'd like to leave feedback on this episode and the discussion we're about to have, uh, please go to the Babel Conference and leave your thoughts there. And we would love to talk about them in an upcoming episode. As we mentioned at the top of the show today in the feature, we are talking about Star Trek Voyager Spirit Walk Book One Old Wounds by Christy Golden. There's a whole bunch of colons in there somewhere. Uh, it's a really long title uh, for not a very long book. This is the third book of the Voyager relaunch, I guess you can call it. Christy Golden also wrote the first two novels, and this is the start of a duology continuing that story. But Bruce and I, cannot discuss this book alone so we've invited a very special guest to join us brandy how's it going hi guys very special oh my goodness i feel very honored to be here i love podcasting with you guys (laughs) awesome yeah live from the edges own brandy jackala so happy to have you on i'm so happy to be here i love doing literary treks and i'm so glad you asked me to come back thank you yakula yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> blah, 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 Dracula. <laughs> <laughs> I wish we were doing a Dracula book for this episode. It would be awesome. I was just going to say, I want a bowl of Count Yakula. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. We're off to a great start. Absolutely. <laughs> Well, as I said, this is continuing the Voyager relaunch, and this all takes place after Voyager has returned home and a bunch of the crew have moved on to uh, bigger and better things. So Captain Catherine Janeway is no longer captaining Voyager and no longer even a captain. She's now an admiral, as we will see her in Star Trek Nemesis. And Chakotay has recently become the new captain of the starship Voyager. And Voyager now is just another ship in the fleet, no longer sailing the wild seas of the Delta Quadrant. She's back at home uh, doing missions for Starfleet, just like any other starship. And a lot of the crew, we've got people returning and a lot of new faces as well. Now, one of the topics that was explored in the first two books was how the Voyager crew missed out on the Dominion War. And that theme kind of continues to play in this novel, especially through the makeup of the new Voyager crew who were introduced to fairly early on. So for example, a lot of the crew members that were on Voyager feel a tension with the new crew members who didn't serve their time in the Delta Quadrant, but at the same time, they also went through the Dominion War, which is something that the Voyager crew didn't uh, experience. So what did you guys think of this kind of dynamic between the two parts of the crew here? Well, I actually expected that to happen. I expected there to be tension because... I guess even in the future, there are still going to be those people who will have this opinion of, well, what I went through is harder than what you went through. And there's really no comparison because they were completely different experiences. And let's just face it. It's just hard. It's everything that everybody went through was just hard. And why they can't come together on that point is kind of frustrating because apparently that's something humanity has not evolved out of yet. <laughs> but not just humanity, because I know that there are non-human crew members on Voyager, but I ex- I expected that tension. I didn't expect to start so quickly, though. 
But yeah. This was a tension I never considered when I thought about Voyager returning home because I always thought about the Maquis crew members having a hard time fitting in or getting or having people accept them because they were Maquis and it would be a difficult adjustment for them. First, they had to fit in with a Starfleet crew on Voyager. Now they have to go to Earth and prove themselves to them, which is still part of the stories that we're getting in some of these books. But I never considered how Starfleet officers that remained on Earth were fighting in the Dominion War while Voyager was lost. When you bring those two type of officers together, ones that fought the war and ones that didn't, it starts the whole process that we saw in Caretaker, where you're merging one crew with another and they don't see eye to eye. And now here we are repeating that again, but in a different way. So I kind of like that because it's a mirror of what Voyager first went through. It's almost like the Voyager is cursed to bring people together that don't see eye to eye or have opposing points of views or are competing with each other. Cursed or, or is it actually a place where people can be brought together who wouldn't have been brought together otherwise? Did I steal your thunder, Dan? I'm sorry. <laughs> no, not at all. That's you made you made the point perfectly. It's a ship not of a curse, but of opportunity to come together in under the shared valiant I've I've lost that sentence started out great. The shared but, values you know, of the Federation and Starfleet. There you go. I should have just let you go with it. <laughs> Absolutely. No, yeah, that's uh it's something that I kind of appreciated. And I think, you know, whether there was a Dominion War or not, it was kind of a, a story that would be interesting to deal with, you know, people coming from Voyager from the Delta Quadrant going through what they did and the people from home not going through that or going through completely different experiences. And like you, Brandy, I'm kind of frustrated with some of these people that they just can't, you know, it it seems like almost a lack of empathy yeah. to not be able to see things from the other side. I mean, both experiences were incredibly difficult in very different ways and yeah, it's this it's this competing that my pain is worse than your pain and can't we just appreciate that we all have pain together and come together, which I'm sure, you know, as this duology continues in the next book, I'm sure that will happen very clearly, I think, between two particular characters we see in this book. Um, but, you know, overall, I feel like the author is trying really hard to make that connection between this and what Voyager went through in early Star Trek Voyager with the Maquis and the Starfleet crew members. The thing that bugged me about it, and I'm wondering if you guys felt the same way, is, you know, as they were doing it, I was kind of in my head, I was like, oh, that's interesting. They're drawing a parallel between those two situations. That's really cool. You know, I like that they're just letting letting that grow and exploring that issue. And then Harry Kim's talking to his girlfriend, Libby, Libby and he just has to outline it in case any readers didn't get it. And he's like... Libby, do you remember early on I told you about how Voyager had the crew members, the Maquis and the Starfleet, and they were at each other's throat? And she's like, yeah, I do remember that. Well, that situation is repeating itself now with it. And I'm just like, oh, man, can't you can't you author give us the readers credit to not like have to handhold that for us? That moment was really annoying to me. Yes, it was. That moment was very frustrating. But I know that some things are not always an author's choice. Sometimes that's true. It is an editor's <laughs> choice or it is, you know, an, an executive's choice that because that's how really stupid things make it into books and movies and television <laughs> is because they're assuming that the audience is stupid. And I don't necessarily think that that was Christy Golden. I could be wrong, but I don't really think that she would be that heavy handed just to make that point very clear. I think that might have been an editor thing or a higher up it thing. It could have been an editor or not, but I just know that the authors try to write Star Trek books in case there are people who don't read that much Star Trek or see that much Star Trek. And maybe they felt like, well, as somebody who isn't all that familiar with Voyager, maybe they've watched a handful of episodes aren't that familiar with the Maquis and what went on the first season. And we just want to kind of call that out. I, I don't know, but I just know that that scene didn't bother me. It didn't stand out to me like it did for you, Dan. I remember it. It didn't make me roll my eyes and go, Oh, come on. Dan's going to be upset if he reads this. <laughs> 
Yeah, and I, I think I'm overstating things a little bit. It didn't like make me really mad. I was just like a little annoyed. Like, yeah, yeah, we get it. Thank you. You know, but that's a very good point that there are, of course, other readers who don't have our experiences. And this maybe comes back to the first point that maybe I need to feel a little bit more empathy for a reader who's coming to it with, you know, less encyclopedic knowledge of Star Trek behind him or her uh, than I have. So. Yeah, because some of these readers may have been stuck in the Delta Quadrant, so they missed <laughs> out on what happened. Or we're not... Yeah, well, they weren't here, and they didn't have to deal with what I went through, so... <laughs> yeah. We had to read many novels. Or, or we should remember... <laughs> The time period, I mean, of our history in which this book was written, and there wasn't the kind of availability of knowledge on the internet that there is today. Because this was, what, 2004? Is that right? Can't be that long ago, but it must be, you're right. (laughs) 2004, yeah, Yeah, wow. Yeah, so that's 15 years ago. And And we just don't think about it until we really have to think about it, that there wasn't the same amount of information available then that there is now. And so it may seem mm. a little bit heavy handed to us now, but it may not have in the time in which it was written. That makes sense. I like it. Well, uh, like we said, Voyager is uh, very early in the book launched on this new mission that it's going on. And we'll talk a little bit more about the specifics of that mission when we get kind of into more spoiler territory for the book. But while this is going on, there's also a second story taking place on Boreth. And this is that Klingon world the uh, where the monks hang out. Uh, recently got a little bit of airtime on Star Trek Discovery. Uh, Torres and Paris are hanging out there trying to find out more about their daughter and how she may or may not fit into Klingon mythology. If you might remember in season seven, they encountered those Klingons in the Delta Quadrant who proclaimed that Miral Paris is the Kuvamak, the uh, messiah, basically, of Klingon society, according to certain sects of the Klingon religion. Now, this part of the story, I I really enjoy. There's some really great character moments in this. I think uh, Paris and Torres have this really cool dynamic that this book allows to explore a little bit more. But this this story doesn't really go very far until the very end. It kind of seems to be treading water a lot with Paris, you know, complaining about writing using a pen and ink and uh, them hanging out in a library reading texts. Would you, what did you guys think of this part of the story? I wanted more. I wanted mm-hmm. I was excited when I realized that they were going to continue the story in the book and then what I got out of it was not what I had hoped for. <laughs> I just I wanted more. I wanted same. I just felt like I still feel like that whole story could have been a book all on its own and that there is enough material there. So I felt like again it's taking a back seat to other things that are happening, whereas I find that an interesting enough story that I want to have that be, you know, at the forefront in its own book. But obviously that is a foolish wish because this book has already been written many years ago. (laughs) So, yeah, I just I wanted more from it. And when it finally does pick up at the end, I thought, well, that's just for cliffhanger value right there. Mm -hmm. And I was Mm -hmm. a little bit a little bit annoyed not not a huge amount annoyed because i kind of expected it from how the story was not progressing and i just thought yeah okay you better make up for this in book two (laughs) well that's a good point because that's where it didn't bother me so much because i felt like well it's not over because this is a two book series so i figured they're just this is just water dripping out of the faucet kind of you know taking its time because it's building to something that we're going to get in book two. So I really enjoyed it. I like the idea of them in the library and looking through the text to figure out where, you know, the prophecy came from with Muriel being the chosen one or whatever. And, and just, and, and Paris just struggling with this is kind of stupid or this is dumb. And even Balan is like, yeah, I know, but, Still, you know, we got to do this. It's, you know, 
at least I, at first I thought maybe she would be very defensive with him, but she seemed to be kind of on the same page. She was kind of in the middle, like, yeah, I get your point, but I also understand this is my heritage and this is something we need to look at. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think my favorite part of that story was the revelation that the only cute animal in the entire Klingon Empire is like skinned to make this paper that they're writing on. <laughs> that was I, I, Paris's reaction to that was hilarious and even Bolana's reaction was really great that was weird the <laughs> visuals i was having was like am i reading this right because this is really weird it's, it's a bit it's a bit dark yeah <laughs> it's klingons they don't do anything that's not you know dark <laughs> yeah ex- and they realize oh we've eaten some of this too actually yeah, except for their nursery. Their nursery is top notch. That sounded really cool. I, know, I really right? liked it. I kind of wanted to see more of this like Klingon nurse character. Yep. Like he sounds awesome. I I'd love to see more of him in action. Yeah. And it's it's that's not to say that I didn't enjoy what I got. I was just hoping for more instead of just kind of this passing the time for a little bit until we can slap you with a cliffhanger and make you hang on till the next book. So, yeah. but I, I enjoyed what I got. I just, it's not, it's not what I felt it deserved. I guess that's the right way to put it. Yeah. I felt it deserved more. Yeah. But, you know, I will say this is the, probably the best time for me to say this. At first, I was a little annoyed when that storyline started. And it's not the story itself. But when I was going into this book, for some reason in my mind, I was thinking this was going to be more of a standalone of Voyager with Chakotay as captain and his new crew, I wasn't expecting there to be these other storylines taking place with our former, quote, unquote, former Voyager crew off doing other things. Like, I was just looking at it as like, okay, this is Chakotay. He has his crew. It's almost like when we got the Titan novel. It was like it was just focused 100% on that new crew. And that's what I was expecting from this. But when it was like, oh, we're going to visit Janeway. Oh, we're going to visit Bolana and Tom. And I was like, at first I was like, oh, no, I, I didn't want it to be like, oh, we have to force these other characters into the story when they have nothing to do with the main storyline, at least so far at this point. Yeah, there are definitely disparate storylines going on. And going back to what you said as well, Brandy, with the whole, you know, this storyline just kind of creeps its way up to a cliffhanger ending. I feel like this is going to be a recurring theme in almost all of the parts of this book that we talk about, because more than just about any book we've read so far on literary treks ever that I can think of, this one really feels like it's just moving pieces in place for, you know, an epic story to pay them all off in book two, which you know, I guess that's fine if it's a dual, you know, it's a duology going in, but at the same time, I would have liked more to have happened in this book. And I don't feel like anything really actually happens in this book with the exception of Chakotay taking command of Voyager and meeting his new crew until like the last quarter of the book, if not less than that, like everything just kind of happens in that part of the book. And it's all just cliffhanger setups for what's going to happen in the next book yeah it's kind of like if you were watching part one of the best of both worlds except that part one was 75 percent just the crew going about their daily business (laughs) and then the last Mm -hmm. 25 percent oh there's the borg oh they've got picard oh no (laughs) that's kind of how i thought of it in my brain also actually and i should say speaking of picard we do see him and his crew very briefly at the very beginning of this novel. And uh, I think uh, it's it's pretty much obviously setting things up for the next book and the end of this novel because it's, it's this very limited scene in which they're transporting a Cardassian scientist who we've met in holographic form on Voyager, Krell Moset, who's known as the Butcher of Bajor, who committed all these atrocities and these experiments during the Cardassian occupation. And they're transporting him following the Battle of Beta Zed. Uh, now, I've never read the Battle of Beta Zed, but after reading this, I'm assuming Krell Moset plays a role in it or something like that. Oh, well, see, I wanted to know more about that, so I did go on Memory Alpha 
And uh, oh, so, yeah, if you want to know more. That's cheating. You can't do I'm that. Not, that's cheating. I'm not sharing. I just wanted to know more <laughs> about what the Battle of Beta Z was. Cause, the cliff notes of the Star Trek literary yeah. universe. Well, I just I want I basically just read the the Memory Alpha entry about Kralnoset so that I could get a grasp on who he actually was versus the holographic representation of him in Voyager. And what I read was disturbing at best. So mm -hmm. just uh, and then to be lauded as a hero for curing this Bajoran disease. Yeah, but the way he got there, guys, the ends do not justify the means. Very much. I mean, and the the Voyager episode he's in is nothing human. And it's very much an allegory for, you know, the experiments that Nazi doctors did uh, in Germany and, and countless other atrocities around the world and that you know the advancements in medical science that have come from really horrible events mm -hmm. you know it's really disturbing so i can imagine what else he gets up to in the novels as well it's not good i haven't read the battle of beta z but it's been on my list yes i know i have a list i've said it before <laughs> but this was on my list before i did literary tracks when my list was a little shorter but now of course it's longer much but much maybe much. we'll get to that one someday, maybe in 2024. Excellent. <laughs> Set a date five years from now. Battle of Beta Z. Perfect. I'll come back Put for on that your one. calendar. Yes, do I that. I want to come Grant. back for that. So. Another relationship that is continued on from the previous books is that of Libby and Harry Kim. And of course, Libby was Harry's girlfriend when they, when Voyager first got lost in the Delta Quadrant. They came back home and reunited. Libby is a concert uh, musician who plays an alien instrument that's kind of a very niche uh, instrument, but, you know, it affords her the ability to travel to all these different venues and perform. And she's also hiding a dark secret. She is an operative for Starfleet Intelligence, and Harry Kim doesn't know this. And so recently, Harry Kim has asked her to marry him. But because she's keeping that secret, she felt that it was unfair to proceed to that next level of the relationship. So she told him not never, but not yet kind of thing was kind of her answer to that, uh, which is understandably a little devastating to Harry. But they're still together. They're still making it work as much as one can make a relationship work when someone is completely hiding their way of life from their partner. Uh yeah. <laughs> so what do we think? And it gets a little bit of play in this novel. Not a lot. We see them converse a little bit. But what are you guys thoughts on the Harry Libby relationship at this point? Well, I'm glad they're still together because I like them together. But again, like what we were discussing about other story elements of this book, it's not really going anywhere very fast. It's just kind of moving slowly, just like their relationship. But, uh, <laughs> you know, it's not, you know, I almost, I guess because we're watching so much discovery lately, I kept thinking, gosh, this sounds like something like she'll be in section 31 soon. Like everybody who's not part of a crew seems to get into section 31 lately, <laughs> but, um, <laughs> you know, she can't talk about anything. Things are secrets or whatever, but I do like their relationship and I know what their future holds from reading books that come after this. And I'm liking how we're seeing them together. I do enjoy that. I just I hope they stay together because I haven't read those books that you've read. <laughs> anyway, I just... I didn't say that they aren't together. <laughs> I know, but you didn't say that they are either, and that's fine. I, I'm a... Well, I was trying not to say anything. <laughs> I know, reason. I know, I know. That's what, that's what I mean. It's fine that you don't say anything. My personal feeling, not knowing what their future holds, is that she's got to come clean sometime. She's got to. There's there's no mm. other way to live her life or she is she will be alone forever if she continues to keep this secret because she will never be able to marry Harry without explaining, you know, who she really is, what she's really been doing aside from what he knows about. And she would never be able to have a relationship with anyone else on those same grounds. So it's just she's if she you know, wants to continue to have a relationship with Harry, she's going to have to come clean at some point. Yeah. And it's, you can tell it's this source of tension between the two of them every time they talk. And I mean, as it would be, you know, 
Um, but Libby also has another thing that she's working on in this book. And again, I'm going to say like the ter- Torres in Paris story, like the Janeway story that we'll talk a little bit about that doesn't really have much of a story yet, but it's clearly being set up for the next book. This one is, you know, Libby is investigating a leak in Starfleet again, just like in the previous two books. And she's, you know, questioning admirals and finding out where they are and where they were at various times and all this stuff. And again, this is another part of the story that just doesn't really go anywhere. And I'm assuming there's going to be some big explosive payoff in book two. But at this point, it's again, just really hard to kind of say much about it other than, okay, so that's happening. Yeah. I feel again, it's just another case of Chekhov's gun, except it's Chekhov's mole or it's Chekhov's prophecy or it's all of these things. Chekhov's, you know, all these things are being set up and they're going to get paid off in the next book. I, I fully believe that they are going to get paid off. Whether it will be in a satisfactory way, I can't say yet because I did not read ahead. So, but all of these things have been set up. So if you've, if you've shown these things in the first book, you've got to pay them off in the second. So this is where I felt that we were going to have a problem on this episode. And that is because this is a book that, Dan, as you mentioned earlier, is a fairly short book book compared to most current modern day Star Trek novels. And so to me, this feels like this is a book that was chopped in half and made into two parts. And we're talking about the first half of a book. And so it's hard to talk about this book one in much detail because it's more setting up story. And it's not until we get to our next episode of Literary Treks when we talk about book two where all of a sudden we're probably going to be talking about, oh, now we have the answers and now this makes sense and now whatever. And so the the feeling I have about us discussing this book is almost like this book. There really isn't a whole lot there. Mm-hmm. It's not a criticism that the book's bad, but to me, it just feels like it really wasn't a complete book. And now we're going to continue that story in a second book. Nothing really got resolved. Very true. Yeah. Very true. Definitely true. Well, um, I think at this point, uh, we we have kind of um, a little bit of a rundown of some of the other characters that we haven't really talked a lot about, Uh, kind of talking a little bit about what they're up to in this novel. So uh, Admiral Janeway, we mentioned she's now an admiral. And in this book, she's setting out on a diplomatic mission, basically, to keep a number of Federation worlds in the Federation, because there's kind of this movement afoot uh, following the end of the Dominion War that a number of these member worlds are kind of feeling uh, that the Federation doesn't share their values and that they want to leave the Federation And that's where that story is left. So again, that's probably going to get paid off in the next book. Uh, Seven of Nine and the Doctor. I thought this was a really interesting use of their characters. They're both members of a think tank who basically troubleshoot problems for the Federation and sit around and discuss solutions to varied problems, kind of putting their brain power to work. Occasionally there are food fights as there are in all the best think tanks, <laughs> but uh, they solve the Federation's hardest, most difficult problems, which I thought was a really cool use of their characters. The doctor though is kind of caught up in a bit of controversy uh, following the whole Oliver Baines holographic uh strike and all the other stuff that happened in those previous books with him because the doctor is kind of still championing those rights. He's being painted with that brush a little bit and he's made a recent speech about holographic rights that didn't really go over very well because it's a sensitive issue right now with the recent happenings. And, you know, some people are saying maybe he should just cool it for a while. And he of course wants to continue championing those rights. So there's definitely some tension there. And we even get a little bit of a mention of Neelix, which is really cool. He sent congratulations to Chakotay on his promotion. So a little taste of Neelix there. So what did you guys think of some of these storylines and and how they're working with this book? Oh, those were in there? Oh, yeah, I forgot. (laughs) (laughs) No, I didn't forget because I put those in the notes. Um, I thought that was you. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, the doctor was, was pretty interesting in what he's going through that to me, 
that didn't feel like something that maybe will get resolved. That, that's another thing with Christy Golden. I wondered if there was some of these elements she was putting in this book, thinking that even when she got past book two, she would be writing other Voyager novels. Cause mm. I don't really see these minor storylines with these characters. There wasn't much of it in here to really, you're you're not really that invested in it that you really can't wait to book two to see what happens because even if they do resolve those or do something with it it's probably not going to be a whole lot i almost again it's like we we're talking about editor i just wondered if they were forcing her to make sure that she had every voyager character in there in some element so she was just putting these minor storylines in there that mm-hmm. would be my guess and it should be noted that book two isn't particularly big either so I'm definitely not expecting any kind of, if these are addressed, any kind of big fleshed out, you know, resolutions. So that's a good point. On on the whole situation with the doctor, I understand why people think that he should, you know, just cool it for a while. But I disagree with that notion completely. No, don't cool it. Keep pressing the issue. Keep it in the forefront. If we all just sit back and become complacent, history repeats itself. So he is doing the exact right thing. And he's frustrated because, you know, people are just, they just don't care. But that's the thing. You don't stop just because the people you're talking to don't care. You keep talking and you keep talking and you keep talking until they can't help but listen. That's what you do. And that's what he's doing. And I'm proud of him. I had a feeling you would have some uh, impassioned views on that. You were so correct. I'm, I'm really glad you said that because I agree completely. Absolutely. Thank you for that. That was beautiful. That's my pleasure because I was just I was just so upset for him and so upset at other people like Janeway thinking, oh, it's not going to go well. That's not the point. That's not the point. The point is you keep fighting until you affect change, period. Who cares if people think, oh, it's too soon, it's too sensitive. No, this is the time to talk about it now. It is now. Awesome. Well, I feel like this is probably the point where we should say we're going to get into spoilers and talk about, you know, what the main plot of this book is, um, you know, such as it is. I, th- I think the, and oh, and I see Brandy's eyes lighting up. So I think we're going to be approaching some subject matter here that she's really excited to talk about. Well, so. I don't know if I'm se- overselling it, but <laughs> there are some things I'm just like, <laughs> what in the heck is this leading to? And when we finally got to that point, I was just like, I should have seen that coming and I didn't. You got me. <laughs> oh, man, you got me. So it's always it's always exciting for me when I get surprised. As we mentioned earlier, Voyager is setting out on its first mission since coming back from the Delta Quadrant. Uh, Starfleet has stripped out all the futuristic technology so it doesn't have that cool armor and doesn't have Borg parts anymore. But, you know, she's just a ship of the line being led by Chakotay. And their mission is to a planet called Loran 2, which was one of the colonies that was caught up in the whole demilitarized zone, Cardassian Treaty, that sort of thing with, you know, members of the colony who joined the Maquis and members who didn't and stayed behind and all that sort of stuff. And they have a number of the former colonists from Lauren II aboard the ship, and they're transporting them back there. They've recently lost contact with the planet, and they're kind of investigating as to why. They don't know what they're going to find when they get there, uh, if the colony's been wiped out or if the people there are still alive. And what's really cool about this story is a lot of elements of this mission have personal bearing on members of the crew. And the first one I want to talk about is the new chief medical officer of Voyager, who's a character we were introduced to in the previous two books, uh, Dr. Kaz, who is a recently joined Trill. The ship that he formerly served on rescued a number of people, a number of Maquis, and one of them was a joined Trill with the Kaz symbiont, who of course didn't make it. And the symbiont was going to take a turn for the worse, so they had to he made the decision to take the symbiont into into himself and become a joined trill uh and this former host Gradak, i think is the pronunciation he was a maquis and because of this mission back into this area of space with a colony that you know came under the cardassian rule and all this stuff the experiences of this former host are being reawakened uh so this story 
I found was really interesting. There's a whole bunch of stuff with the new counselor. Um, but I'm going to let Brandy talk a bit about this because I feel like she's got some stuff to say. I'm just dying to know. Oh gosh. I know. Well, me too. <laughs> don't, don't oversell it guys. <laughs> don't oversell it. Um, <laughs> I loved Kaz from the, uh, the previous Voyager novels, Homecoming and The Farther Shore. And that was a character I wanted to see more of. And so I was thrilled when I found out he was going on on board Voyager with this crew and becoming part of the main crew for the ship. I was just like, yes, I want to know more about this guy because he is so cool. And then he starts exhibiting these symptoms of what I recognized immediately as post-traumatic stress disorder. And I, and that's when we finally get the story of how this, how he was joined. And by all rights, the medical chances of both of their survival were very low, but the EMH did a great job. And so, and I thought, yeah, but that's not the reason. And so when, when they decide, he and the counselor decide to go undergo this sort of, well, I guess it's almost kind of like a spirit walk. It's kind of a parallel to that where, He's allowing Greydock to come forward and say his piece so th- because he needs this to be known. He needs people to know what happened. And he didn't get that chance before, you know, the body died, the host died, and, and Kaz was transferred to a new host. And I found that whole situation very compelling there is there is actually more than one example of person of a person going through post traumatic stress disorder on voyager right now and i think you know what the other one is that i'm talking about so uh i just i i loved this insight into how kaz was trying to handle this on his own and he he chose finally to go to the counselor he chose to do that. That is, that takes a lot of strength because people think that, you know, you're weak if you ask for help. No, you're strong. If you ask for help, you are strong, made stronger by getting help to fix whatever ails you. And this is apparently, you know, I think he was hoping that this was just going to be a one and done sort of thing. And it's not turning out that way. And I, Really am interested to see how his character progresses, especially with how this book ends, because I think Greyhack is going to be on the warpath. And I think that Kaz mm-hmm. is going to have a difficult time reining that in. So I just, I really enjoy, it's difficult to say I enjoyed this part of the story because it's heart wrenching, but I appreciate the courage of the character and what he and the counselor go through. And it just, it was just like, we need more examples of stuff like this happening so that people stop thinking, oh, you're weak if you ask for help. We need people to stop thinking that. And they still do in this day and age. And it's not, that's mm-hmm. not how it is. Asking for help makes you stronger. And sadly, I feel like this is pretty rare in Star Trek, yes. too, when someone goes to the counselor recognizing that they have a problem and seeking help for it. It always seems to be the cliche of, you know, you have to go see the counselor. I'm ordering you to not miss your sessions, blah, blah, blah. And there's always this resistance, which, you know, is, is very common. So, you know, Star Trek is not a show that's made in the 24th century. It's made in the 20th and 21st centuries for us. So, you know, I feel like that's important to show people that yes, you're going to resist, but it's ultimately for good. But I do really love, like you said, that we finally see somebody taking matters into their own hands and recognizing that they have a problem and going ahead and, and doing something about it and seeing a professional. That was really excellent. Yeah. It's, it, I already loved the character and this just made my love that much stronger. I was just like, dude, I am with you. I am with you. I want this to succeed. I want you to be comfortable again in your own skin and with your symbiote. I just, I want that for him so much. He's so compelling. Yeah. I I mean I had a problem with this part of the book because I thought he's not he's not being a man by taking it on himself. <laughs> I just about spat water all over. <laughs> we almost had a spit take. That would have been oh, oh it would have been an expensive oh, one. Wow. No. Um, no, I really like this part of the book. It's my favorite part of it. Kaz is my favorite character in this book. He's not necessarily my favorite Voyager character, but within this story, 
he's my favorite character because of the reasons you just said. I kept expecting him to fight against it. You know, at some point say, no, I'm not going to do this. I mean, there's times he was a little hesitant, but he really just realized, you know, he has to take matters in his own hands and deal with this. And imagine having PTSD that's really not your own, but someone else's that you're experiencing. How weird is that? And then to bring that up into the forefront and then be called to duty. And now it's up there in in your face, not just dreams and flashbacks you're having, but all those memories are with you. And you have to go through your day to day while trying to figure out what all this is and what this all means. And he handles it well, but then he, he does something where he's able to suppress it again temporarily But, you know, he's got a lot of struggles he has to go through. It's very interesting to have a symbiont in yourself that has all these different memories and experiences. And no wonder they have to train certain Trill to be able to handle this. And he's not trained and he's handling it very well. It's surprising someone like him wasn't accepted to be a host to begin with, because I think he's got his act together. The one part of the story that annoyed me and it was just it was just a little thing but he mentions that he's never been back to trail you know to deal with any of this and based on everything that we know about the trail and how they handle symbionts and all that sort of stuff i would have expected them to like place him under arrest and bring him home to deal with this stuff before you know he just resumes his duties and you know as a member of the federation getting in touch with starfleet and saying no you're taking him off duty and he's coming back home to trill right now kind of thing but it was it was a minor thing i understand you know in order to set up what's going on that you know he has to be unaware and and not know how to do this kind of stuff so but it was just a little thing i was like "Mm, they're pretty protective of those things is it possible that they on trill they don't know that Kaz's previous host had passed away. It's I mean, possible. I would think they would be told, but yeah. It's possible. To be fair, yeah, he was a Maquis, so a member of an insurgent group and not really reporting to anybody at the time. So that's a very good point. They just may not have ever known. Yeah. Yeah. I, Which what, they didn't explain that in the book, but it certainly could be. That's a good point. Absolutely mm-hmm. good point. I hadn't thought of it that way, but that that part hadn't really bothered me because I was just, you know, thinking about Esri Dax and I thought, well, if they were so protective, maybe they learned their lesson with Esri. I don't know. It's just some, <laughs> but if they'd really learned their lesson, I don't know. There's so many if, if, ifs in there, but uh, it's, it's something that it kind of niggled a little bit, but not enough for me to stop and say, hey, wait a minute. So there were there were other things that made me stop and say, hey, wait a minute, but that wasn't one of them at the time. Here's a what if. What if Jerem Kaz dated Esri Dax? Oh, weird. Just weird. Just <laughs> weird. They would be all confused <laughs> with each other. I also feel like they talk about Jerem as being a much older person. Yeah. And not, not that I'm saying there's anything wrong with that. I'm not ageist. You know, there's, you know relationships like that that work but i just i don't know i still think of esri as very youthful yeah yeah and i don't mean i don't i don't mean that i would ship these two i'm just saying like you know these are two trill that weren't you know trained to host symbionts and then they both were in crisis where they have to have a symbiont in them and they don't know how to handle it and then they're dating each other and they're probably both looking at each other going i don't know what to do either well you know who could really help them out with that who would be a Huani marriage counselor because apparently the Huani are just amazing counselors because they're so completely empathetic. Uh, They are in touch with their emotions in a way that other people, other races aren't. They're hyper emotional, um, but they can, you know, see kind of all sides of an issue and they're, they're just amazing counselors and every Starfleet ship is apparently trying to have a Huani counselor so in this particular instance the counselor on voyager is a huani named astal Uh, what did you guys think of this character i actually really liked her and when i heard you know in the exposition of the book when they're describing what the huani are like i'm like am i part huani because this is how i react that's what i was wondering (laughs) this is is how i react (laughs) to so many things 
<laughs> you are Huani. I guess so. <laughs> Except I'm not tall and willowy, and my skin isn't. Uh, is is it, it? Their skin is is like a light purple. Is that right? If I remember correctly. Yeah. Yeah. Purple. Yeah. Well, I am kind of. I do have some pink undertones going on here, so I could get to like a lavender purple, maybe. So, <laughs> but I was just thinking, wow, uh, I can't, I'm I'm really feeling this right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, you need those kangaroos. Oh, I know that would be too, awesome, right? I would love to have a pair of those. <laughs> Which have to stay in a certain position if you're a Starfleet officer, because it's too revealing if they move around as to what your emotions are. Yeah, I I get that. <laughs> well, it would be nice to have my ears, you know, emitting my emotions rather than my entire face. So, you know, <laughs> I could deal with that. I'm excited. <laughs> Dan's moving his ears. <laughs> I love it. I love it. No, I, I really, I really enjoyed her and I identified with her on many levels. Yeah, this was a character I thought was really interesting. When they were first talking about her, it seemed odd to me just the way they were describing her as, you know, there's this race and they're really good as counselors. And every time, you know, it came up. Chakotay is like, oh, our counselor's a Huani. Did you hear? We have a Huani counselor. It's amazing. It's so great. We were able to get one. And I was like, it, it, sounded a little like they were commodifying this particular race but you know then you meet her and you're like okay she's a fully realized person and it's all okay <laughs> but like at first it just seemed a little bit weird they usually don't talk about races like that in star trek the closest that it kind of reminded me of is in star trek the motion picture and commander sonak dies on the transporter mm. And they said, we need a new science officer. And Kirk says, I'd still like a Vulcan there if possible or something yeah. like that. He's like, eh, OK, I guess that kind of happens. Yeah. There's one final aspect to this story. And these colonists that, that they're transporting back to Lauren to have requested a spiritual advisor as well as the services of Astal as a counselor. The spiritual advisor beams on board. And to Chakotay's surprise, it's his sister, Sakaya. Uh, who has never been mentioned in canon Trek before, but uh, he they have mentioned that he does have a sister. So it all works in canon. It's fine. Um, and this sister grew up with him on Dorvan 5, which is that colony that we saw in the TNG episode Journey's End. Now, it's clear that she's been hiding something. And when Chakotay returned from the Delta Quadrant, he visited his planet and they told him everything was fine. The Cardassians never came here. We were kind of untouched by the Dominion War and all that kind of stuff. And, oh, that's great. And they, you know, reunited and all that sort of stuff. But that doesn't seem to be the entire truth. And Sakaya is very clearly keeping something from him. And to my mind, that is stretched out really long in this novel to a point where it was just... You know, I understand there are deep emotions associated with everything going on and all that kind of stuff. But did that bug you guys as well? Just how long they kept teasing that there was some issue there that she wasn't telling him. And it's pretty obvious to us readers that something happened and should probably be obvious to Chakotay as well. well I felt like they were dragging it out because it was going to be really earth shattering. And it really wasn't for me. Like by the time she revealed it, I mean, it's. It's something that's bad, but I was just expecting something more explosive to the point where, oh my gosh, no wonder she hadn't told Chakotay this. But I didn't mm -hmm. really see once she told him, like, oh, well, why, why did this take so long? <laughs> mm -hmm. And to me, it just made me ask, why wouldn't they have told him in the first place? Right. Like, I didn't really get the rationale for hiding it from him to begin with. That's why I was expecting it to be something where, you know, we couldn't tell Chakotay. We can't tell him. And if he finds out, then, and then, you know, when she does tell him, he's like, oh, wow, that really sucks. <laughs> like, it mm -hmm. wasn't like any big deal. I mean, it was a big deal, but not to him to the point that it's like, it he had to be protected from it. Yeah, mm -hmm. it made no sense to me either why she was hanging on to it for so long. And I would have found it refreshing if she had actually gotten all of that out during that first long conversation that they had once she had come on board. Yeah. That would have been so refreshing, but alas... It it became a, a comedy of errors and misconnections from that point on until, you know, they she simply can't avoid telling him anymore. So I found the whole situation frustrating and kind of it didn't make sense to me. 
it, like mm-hmm. both of you, it's like, why would they have kept this from him? What was the point of protecting him from this? He's a big boy. He's the captain of a starship. I think he can take it. So what is it about that situation that is, I just, I just don't get why it was such a big deal for her to tell him. And the situation we're talking about, we should say, uh, basically the colony, it was under Cardassian control because it was on the other side of the border with the new treaty negotiation. And the Cardassians came to the planet and basically had everybody kind of report to one centralized location for cataloging. And over the course of a period of time, it, you know, becomes more and more clear that they're doing some experiments on, on various people in the colony. And these of course are undertaken by the aforementioned Krell Moset, who shows up at the conclusion of this novel completely expectedly because we saw him supposedly killed at the beginning of the book. And also he's, on the cover of book two, but you know, <laughs> putting that aside, I didn't even look at the cover of book two yet, but yeah, I was totally expecting it to be him. Yeah. Especially if the beginning and then he's not there for a while, you know, he's coming back. Yeah. But mm-hmm. yeah, that dangling Chekhov's yeah, gun for but sure. What I didn't expect the thing that got me was the changeling. Mm-hmm. I was just like, wait, what, 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 What? So when did Priggy get replaced? Was it after he beamed down to the planet? Was it him all along? I don't know. When did that change take place? And now I'm second guessing every scene with him in the book up to that point. I just don't know. Because there are a couple lines that really throw it into question there. Because the changing has taken uh, the form of the first officer, who we didn't really talk a lot about, but his nickname's Priggy, and he's kind of a stick in the mud. Like, he's a stickler for um, orders and routine. By the book. You know. Everything by the book. By the book. He's an absolutely by the book guy. And yeah, there's one line where he says, you know, you almost threw our plans into chaos by ordering him to take the mission instead of. So like, yeah, when did when did he get replaced by this changeling? That's a really good question. I was just assuming he's been replaced the whole time in the book. That was just my. Assumption. Yeah, but then that's but, interesting. But the real guy is there in a, in a, like a, a stasis planet, chamber. So yeah. how did he get there? When did that happen? Just questions that I I will probably get answers to at the beginning of the next book is my guess. Because there'll be lots of exposition. Ha ha! You have now found out that we are the perpetrators of this plan. Let me explain my plan to you in great detail while you are in restraints. So uh, that's what I expect the beginning of the next book to be. I hope I'm wrong, actually. Yeah. And, but. and I feel like he was replaced after they beamed down, but I could be totally wrong about that because there's things that make me I think know, otherwise. There's no way so. to know for sure until know. we get the exposition that tells us. Next episode of Literary Treks, we will know the answer. Yes, we will. <laughs> there's one other aspect of this that I wanted to complain about, because that's what I'm going to do, is I'm going to, going to complain, is... And again, I realize I'm coming to this as someone who has encyclopedic knowledge of Star Trek, of all its incarnations and stuff, but they were talking about the storms forming on the planet whenever they tried to like beam down or or all this kind of stuff. And Chakotay's like, this seems familiar to me. Where have I seen this before? And I'm like, it's the episode tattoo when you learned that earth shattering secret about your people that the white aliens came and, and changed the course of North American natives forever and completely shattered what you always believed about your entire life and your people. You don't remember that? I remembered that. Anyway. Immediately. Yeah. And I mean, like, it was such a fundamental thing in Chakotay's yeah. life that like he would have been like oh my god this is exactly like when we met uh-huh. the Sky Spirits. He didn't do a Voyager rewatch like we do so he doesn't remember <laughs> oh. that episode. Well, I haven't even rewatched <laughs> Voyager recently and I still knew Me neither. I still knew. I'll give you well I guess what I watched that episode uh, last night. Of course you I did. I knew you would too. <laughs> <laughs> and I watched it probably about three or four months ago too but you know Okay, in his defense or in the writer's defense, maybe it's because the storm that the Voyager was dealing with, he was planet side the whole time. So he wasn't really experiencing and witnessing how this storm was stationary and appearing and, and disappearing and stuff because he wasn't involved. He, I'm sure he, I, I don't think that he wasn't aware of it, but 
that experience was something he wasn't experiencing from the ship, but he was on the planet dealing with other things. So it's something more that he learned afterwards. And so he didn't, it's not something, yeah, it's in the back of his mind, but the experience he's had on the planet was so personal that it had nothing to do with the weather. Yeah, but still. <laughs> That's where I stand. Yeah, but still. That's exactly yeah, what I say. Still. <laughs> I'm like, really? Really? You're having trouble remembering why this is familiar to you? Mm. Maybe there's an experience Chakotay had that we never saw in an episode where he has some problems remembering that period of time. Now that's possible. I would buy that because, you know, sky spirits. So, and really, honestly, mm. <laughs> I know this didn't occur to me at the time that I watched the episode, but when I was reading this part of the book and I remembered what the sky spirits looked like and I said, so a bunch of white people came down and altered the course mm -hmm. of the Native Americans. Yep. <sighs> this is what has always bugged me about that yeah. episode. And as soon as they mentioned the storms, I was like, oh, not the sky spirits yeah. again. Like, ah, we recognized a beauty and something in your race. So we elevated you and blah. I'm just like, Oh great. The great white saviors yeah. came and, and made yeah, us all better. And that really awesome. It, and honestly, I wasn't thinking that particular thought when I first saw the episode on a rewatch though, it really hit home. And then when mm -hmm. it, this came up in the book, I just thought, Oh no, I don't want to see uh, these guys. Yeah. Oh, this is wow, you really I agree hate completely. The sky problematic. And maybe in 2004 <laughs> it wasn't quite as problematic, but it would have been for me because I'm just sensitive to those kind of things. It's just like, this is not okay. Not okay. Mm -hmm. Is there anything else uh, about this novel that we should discuss before we go into our Final thoughts and ratings. Brandy, uh, you yeah. have your hand Is this the thing that you had a problem with? This is with? the thing I have a problem with. And maybe, uh, and the thing is, is I, I can kind of understand it go, going from the point of view of how this is happening. But there is this scene where, uh, where uh, David and Rafe and Janine, you know, crew members, and David's already had an altercation with Lissa Campbell with the, my pain was worse than your pain sort of thing, and then tried to apologize to her in a turbo lift, and they were getting on quite well, and then uh, these other crew members come on, and they, they're going to the holodeck, and David wants to try this program that was really popular on Voyager, and so, you know, they, they load this up, and it's a darkened French bistro, and here's the way that it is described. A lovely young woman was performing songs in French to the accompaniment of a piano, and an older but still attractive blonde woman drifted about. Are you kidding me? Absolutely yeah, how enriched. dare they say that an attractive woman is old? <laughs> no, how dare they say that she's, <laughs> oh, she's older, but she's still attractive. I know, I oh, know. Oh, you could just, I didn't even, you just don't. I vaguely remember that. Yeah, yeah, you don't put the, but still attractive. You can put an older, attractive blonde woman, and that's fine. You know, I mean, it's still a little, but it's coming from a guy. A guy's point of view. So, yeah, okay. But you could just take out the butt still, and I wouldn't have been so angry. Mm -hmm. So, why do you think this author, who is a woman, wrote that? I don't know. I truly don't know. You know, it's something else I noticed in this novel, and I was going to make a note about it, but then I decided, no, I'm just going to let it go. But something that struck me as odd is every time she introduced a woman character, she she made some comment about how attractive mm -hmm. they are like it was it was almost universal to the point where i really noticed it was when um sakaya beamed aboard and chakote sees her and his internal thoughts say something like this um I can't remember the exact word it was was used. It wasn't attractive, but this curvaceous, I think, was was the word or something. And I was like, well, that's weird. <laughs> like I just like every single time they mentioned a woman character, it was she was attractive. She was curvaceous. She was uh, compelling, compellingly attractive. All the like it was uh, just something odd that I yeah, noticed. Yeah, it's uh, this was the first time where it stuck. It stuck out to me. And then from that point on, I'm just like, okay, enough. Okay. Who is your audience here? Teenage boys? 
because I can guarantee you there are far more female <laughs> Trek fans than you think. And you need to think about your entire audience, not just what a teenage boy wants to hear about a woman being described. It's just very juvenile to me. I don't care for it. And and even in 2004, this it just has no place. Yeah, it's just stop basing anything interesting about a woman on her appearance. Just please stop doing that. And I don't recall, but they didn't do that in the book with any of the men the characters. Talk about their look, if they were attractive or handsome mm -mm. or I don't recall. Nope. Yeah. Not that I noticed. The the one that I can remember, and it was Commander Ellis is the mm -hmm. first officer, right? Yes. Like she talked about how he looked, but I I could be wrong. I can't remember that she said he was handsome or attractive or nope. anything like that. But he said she he had a regulation mustache trimmed perfectly mm -hmm. and uh, had an impeccable appearance. His uniform was spotless or something like that. But I don't remember anything about whether he was attractive yeah, see, or and not. And that's the thing. The men are never sexualized and the women always are. And it's, please stop doing that. Please. I'm begging you. Either sexualize both of them or sexualize none of them. Pick one. But don't do it with one sex and not the other because that is bias that is prejudice that is misogyny and it shouldn't be coming from a woman and which is not to say there aren't female misogynists and i am not calling christy golden a misogynist i'm not because i don't know her personally and i don't think that it was intentional in any way i think it was just what was wanted for the perceived audience of Trek novels at the time. Hmm, could be. Yeah. I don't know. I am curious to see uh, if she continues that in the second oh, book. I'll be hyper of aware course, of she's it. introduced. Yeah. She's introduced <laughs> a lot of the characters already. So we may not get that in the second book, but I'll be definitely paying more attention to that now. See what happens. But she didn't do it in the other books that we've read so far too. That because you didn't call it out for homecoming and the further, farther, further, 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 <laughs> she she did it a little shore. bit with Libby, but it was more from Harry's mm -hmm. point of view at seeing her again. So that actually made sense to me. But uh, but I didn't find anything in that. Now it makes me want to go back and just skim through it and see if there was stuff I missed. But, you know, it, there there didn't seem to be anything yeah. that I found in there in that first read through where I thought, well, this is this is not fair. This is sexualizing the women and not the men so you know yeah and like i said the one time that it really jumped off the page for me was because I, I remember thinking when sakaya beamed aboard and it was chakotay's sister and i remember thinking well at least she won't be described as attractive for once and then i th and i think that was when the word curvaceous came up and i was like really that's weird but okay huh yeah I just remember them saying that they were a year apart and that they looked alike. And I thought, mm -hmm. so I pictured her, you know, as Chicote, but with long hair. <laughs> How did that work for you? <laughs> it didn't. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> Comedic timing, like you said, it's something that can't, can't be you, learned. You, you're it's born with just... it. You either have it or you don't. <laughs> I had to keep looking at the cover going, oh, no, 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 that's what she looks like there. There. there yeah, that she, that also is not convincing. <laughs> the woman mm. they have. That does not look like Chakotay no, with longer not hair. not even <laughs> a little. She doesn't even look like she is the same skin tone as Chakotay. She looks awfully white, guys. She looks awfully white. Um, anyway... So how about uh, final thoughts and ratings for Old Wounds? Brandy, why don't okay. you go first? Well, uh, this was a very quick read again, and I'm, I'm not complaining about that. There were aspects of the story that were compelling, especially the story with Kaz and uh, the Huani counselor, Astal. I really enjoyed their interaction. There were other things that just, there wasn't enough meat on that bone for me to really chew on. So I'm kind of just like, eh. I didn't hate it. I I didn't love it. I'm looking forward to see how, seeing how this concludes. But I, I wasn't feeling like, oh, I've got to start reading the next book right now, which I wouldn't have done because I promised I wouldn't read ahead. So I would give it, I will give it three out of five emotional kangaroo ears. Excellent. 
that's an image. Bruce, how about you? Yeah, I feel exactly the same way. And I like how you said you didn't feel like you had to go to the next book right away. I felt the same. Maybe because I know I'm going to read it next, but I didn't feel like, oh, I can't wait. It was just seemed as if I'm in a book that, you know, it's pretty good and it just stopped and I have to pick up another book to see the rest of it play out. But there was nothing earth shattering that an intense storyline that I just had to get to the next chapter or the next book to see what happens. So um, I'm going to go maybe just a little higher than you Brandy on this because there are some aspects. I, I, I enjoy the writing. I enjoyed Kaz a lot. So Kaz really helps this book out for me. And, um, and Janeway's mission, which we briefly mentioned, I also like that part. I'm going to give this seven out of 10 Harry Kim proposals to Libby. Note to guys, <laughs> don't ever propose in public guys. Really don't do it. Yeah. Don't, don't no, make your, fi- don't idea. make your potential fiance uncomfortable and pressured to say yes or no in a public place. This is not cool. Don't do it. Well, I think I have to agree with a lot of what's been said. Uh, The one thing I will disagree with was that it was a quick read. And the reason for that was I had a lot of trouble getting into this book. And it was, you know, I hate to say it, and this doesn't happen often, but it was a little bit of work to pick it up and and keep going with it. Um, And again, most of that just comes down to not a lot happening. There's a lot of setup for what's presumably going to come in book two but you know very slowly moving the pieces to where they need to be uh rather than you know really having some interesting events like i think when they set out on their mission to lauren too there's the stuff with kaz which is all really good and and that sort of thing and some you know interpersonal stuff between crew members and and exploration of that which is great But it's well past halfway in the book when they stumble across a debris field, which is like the first thing that happens mission wise on that mission. And it doesn't even really turn out to be much. It's, you know, oh, there must have been a battle here. Let's continue on. Uh, But, you know, let's go to yellow alert kind of thing. And then everything plot wise that happens in this book is right at the very end. So, you know, that was a little bit frustrating. And you know, it's it's not a badly written book. I did enjoy the character work for the most part, with a few exceptions. So I think I'm going to have to give this one three spontaneous storms out of five that form whenever you try to beam down because of sky spirits. Yay. <laughs> so Brandy, when you're not guesting on the literary treks with us, where else can we our listeners uh, find you? You can find me a few places. I am on Twitter. Twitter at Brandywine12. Brandy is with an I, 12 is a number. Or you can follow my alternate reality account, Dark Amy Knows Rockets, at Dark Amy Knows Rock. Um, they only allow you a certain number of characters, so I couldn't get the full name that I wanted, but I got as close as I could. Uh, you'll also hear me with Bruce on Life from the Edge on Friday nights right now at 6 p.m. Pacific and 9 p.m. Eastern. And uh, we talk about the most recent episode of Star Trek Discovery and Dan's going to be on, except by the time this episode comes out, you will have been on. So, (laughs) wibbly wobbly timey wimey. And uh, I do a podcast with my fantastic and wonderful husband, Dave, called the Dark Corner Podcast, where we talk about basically whatever we want. Mostly it's nerdy stuff. And uh, we just look at it from a bit of a darker perspective, almost like it was an alternate reality. No, we're not from the mirror universe, I promise. Not the one you're thinking of anyway. <laughs> and so we do that and you can find that on uh, darkcornerpodcast.com and uh, there are swears. So if you don't like swears, then uh, I invite you not to listen so that you will not be offended. Great. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show. We always love having you here and we'll see you again very soon because our next episode will be about book two in this series. So we're really looking forward to that. I am too. I'm so excited and I'm sorry about the shouty bit. <laughs> <laughs> shouty bits are what make life worth living. Okay, then. I'm really anxious to read the next book because I do feel that we just got half the story, which is really what we got was half the story. It really felt to me as if we were reading a novel and we stopped halfway through and said, Hey, 
let's talk about what we've just read. Yeah. And I think like we've kind of brought this argument up a bit when we talked about the A Time Two novels, but I think even more so than any of the duologies in that series, this one really just feels like not a whole lot happened and we've stopped it at an arbitrary point with some cliffhangers and tune in next week for the exciting conclusion and anything interesting that's going to happen in the next book, you know, so it's, it's a little frustrating that way. Yeah. I think you're right because this one doesn't have a whole lot going on. Uh, Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's building to something, but it didn't build up fast enough to make this a complete book. I feel like we're building up to something and then we'll get to the meat of everything into the next book. You've definitely got a good point there, Bruce. And it's been fun today talking about not a whole lot of anything, but it's not the only thing we've been discussing on the network. So here's a quick look at some of the other things you may have missed elsewhere on Trek FM. Previously on Trek.FM, Earl Grey. You're right. There's there's definitely something that we need to look at with the death. And although it's very sad, but like you're saying, Richard, like the opposite of enjoy the time that you have while you're alive with them. And that's what, and again, as you said, Richard, like if you don't forget them, they really will still be a part of you in your life. And their influence is going to be just as real, you know, from your memory of them. Literary tricks. And so all of that's coming to, and then you get all good things going through your brain of, you know, oh yes, Worf and Troy. And I've always loved them together. And then when I started this reading this book, it brought out this emotion of what? No, this cannot happen. I don't even want to see Deanna with Worf at all. And I was so surprised by that because I've always liked Troy and Worf together. Melodic treks. So somebody that conceivably is into the modern jazz quartet, which is like having some fine wine, sometimes wants a piece of cake and slim and slam that would be cake (laughs) and these sort of not really jump blues or r&b but saxophone players that played modern jazz that were in this bluesier more soul style there were people around then like illinois jaquette and arnett cobb jimmy forrest gene ammons the edge a star trek discovery podcast it's the time is not variable so it's not going to matter if time is the constant there so when he says on my mark that means here it is that's where i need to go so send me there yeah Mic okay drop. i'll buy it but i still don't believe it <laughs> Mic drop and that's what else is happening on trek.fm check out all these shows and join the conversation about your favorite corner of the Star Trek universe and beyond. You'll find us wherever you get your podcasts. Hey, and you may be getting your podcasts from Apple because if you're an Apple user, be sure to hit the subscribe button and Apple podcasts on iPhone, iPad or Apple TV or the desktop iTunes app to get the latest episodes as soon as they are published. And please leave us a star rating and written review. And if you're not an Apple user, we've got you covered as well. You can find our shows on Google Play Music, Stitcher, TuneIn, Speaker, SoundCloud, Windows Phone, YouTube, on and on and on and on, and in most third-party apps. And you can stream and download the MP3 file from our website or just reach out and grab that RSS link. One place you won't find our podcasts, unfortunately, are libraries on Boreth because they don't allow technology in there. So if you're there, you're kind of out of luck. But if you would like to help us keep all of our shows coming to you each week, you can become a patron of the network on Patreon. Just visit patreon.com slash trekfm. That's patreo dot com slash trekfm to get all of the details. Perks include early access to episodes, exclusive content, producer credits, and more. And those are all available through our special patrons website, Patron Zone. It requires a great deal of money to produce, host, and distribute these shows each month. We really appreciate any support you can give us and hope you'll join the team. Again, you'll find all the details at patreon.com slash trekfm. We'd love to hear your thoughts on today's show, and there are many ways for you to do that. The best place to join in on the larger conversation is The Babel Conference, our listeners group on Facebook. Just type Babel, B-A-B-E-L, 
into the search field on Facebook and it should come right up. And if you'd like to send us an email, you can use the form on our website at trek.fm slash contact. Choose to send to a show and select Literary Treks and it will come right to us. You can also find the network on Twitter at trek.fm and on Facebook at facebook.com slash trek.fm. Well, thank you to our special guest host, Mural Paris, for reading some of those uh, URLs out for us. That was excellent. (laughs) Another place you can find us is on our Goodreads group, where we have bookshelves with all of our previously covered books, as well as the currently reading section, so you know what's coming up for future shows. Plus, there are great conversations happening about all the books and comics. Just go to goodreads.com, search for Literary Treks, and click Join Group, and one of us will let you right in. We'd like to thank Norman C. Lau, Ken Tripp, Greg Rosier, Brandon Shemutala, Justin Ozer, and Jeffrey Harlan for their support of the Trek FM network, and for being associate producers for Literary Treks as well. Now, Bruce, when you're not getting picked up by Admiral Janeway for some super secret, crazy diplomatic mission to keep members of the Federation from leaving, where can we find you? You can find me in the library waiting for someone to pick me up. But while I'm there, I'm on Twitter at Admiral underscore Rex. I'm also in the library recording other podcasts like Live from the Edge which is here on the network where we talk about Star Trek Discovery the night after. It's a live show. You can tune in on YouTube and watch us and join the chat or listen to it when it drops as a podcast. And I do that with Brandy Jacola or Jacula, whatever she wants to pronounce her last name, which she still can't figure out what she wants to pronounce it as. And you can also hear me talking about Star Wars on the Star Wars Report. And there's a lot going on coming up this year with Star Wars. So check that out. And of course, you can find me in the library, on and in the Babel Conference. So Dan, when you're not taking a cute animal and using it as parchment to write on, where can people find you? It's the only cute animal that the Klingons even have. Like, (laughs) oh, it's so tragic. Well, thankfully, I've gone mostly paperless and stick to online for the most part. And online, you can find me on Twitter. I'm at Kurtrats. That's K-E-R-T-R-A-T-S. You can also find me on YouTube.com slash Productions and on Facebook.com slash Productions. And of course, I'm always in the Babel Conference. I don't tend to post a lot, but, you know, you can find me lurking in there. And, you know, I, I read. I, I know what you guys are up to. I saw, I saw what you posted. He lurks. You should be ashamed of yourself. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, thank you all so much for listening. And until next time. Live long and read on. You call that light reading? To each his own, number 